Hey, everybody, welcome. Um, welcome to the Dr. Pat Show. Welcome to Transformation Talk Radio. Welcome to the realm of, of conscious confidence. You know, today is a very special day and a very special show. And God, I promised myself I would not like start to tear up here. Um, you know, one of the things that I've become acutely aware of in my life is that if, if I don't take moments of deep gratitude for the people that I have gotten to know and the honoring of the journey, I really am missing something beyond anything you can imagine. And what I mean by that is when I think about Sarah Main and I think about what she has created, conscious confidence, and the fact that we all here have gotten to walk this journey with her, you know, looking at meeting her for the first time and Jessica, you know, being the catalyst for that and then working with her and, and, and learning and understanding the depth and the breadth of her life uh, and what it is she's called to bring forward. And then for me to become a student of learning about something that I vaguely knew about, but didn't have any sense of the power, possibility, and the potential for looking at this world we live in and this wisdom of Sanskrit to find clarity, success, but also peace. And today I couldn't be more honored than I've ever been in telling all of you that in the world that we live in, it is rare that we get to see a dream from beginning to the steps, to the hard work, to the challenges, to the conceptual genius um, that Sarah has created and you're gonna hear about today, but then, this, this, something that is so amazing comes to life. It takes on new meaning for me and all of us here in honoring Sarah and what she believes in and the work she's called to do in this fantastic, amazing book, Conscious Confidence. And this is for me today's show to tell all of you that if you are looking for the most incredible 2020, the decade that you want to start and live in the most robust, amazing, earth-giving consciousness way, for me, in the 15 years I've been doing this, I have never started the year with a book so powerful and a book which all of us here have made a commitment to follow. But let me tell you about Sarah. You know, I think about all the days, the times we've spent together, the creative genius um, that she has, her commitment and her dedication. And for those of you out there, her passion now to work with young people, with youth, you know, people of generations that many of us have looked at and said, oh, they're never going to make it. That's not her. And the reason is this language of enlightenment that she has studied, you know, a scholar of the most in-depth aspects of vibrational energy and clarity. And today for me and all of us here at Transformation Talk Radio, to be part of the release of this book is beyond an honor. Sarah, I must say, I went back and I read the book again. And first of all, welcome. Many folks don't know what the sweat and the, everybody likes to talk about inspiration, but the perspiration <laughs> that went into this, how does this feel? For you. How does this feel? Okay, she's. <laughs> it's incredible, isn't it? But how do you take it all in? Are you like relieved? Uh, well, 
Firstly, hello, Pat, and thank you for a beautiful introduction. <laughs> um, it's wonderful to be with you. Um, yeah, take it all in. I don't know, it's still, I still sort of hold this book in my hand and think, wow, how did this happen? <laughs> you know, because when we first met, I had this seed of an idea that was kind of going in one direction. And we both, and you said to me, you said what I was feeling. I hadn't really put words to it. You said, there's more to this, you realise. And, and when you said that to me, it suddenly thought, yes, there is. Um, but I didn't, and I just kept following the thread. It was like catching a thread, you know, in, yeah. in a sweater and just pulling and following it or pulling a chain up from an anchor. I thought, I'm going to follow this as far as it goes. And, um, you know, here it is. Here but it is. I, I genuinely felt it was um, called out of me. You know, people say that, but it, it, that's what it felt like. And that wasn't some sort of amazing experience. It was work. It, it was like, hello, you know, you think you've worked hard before. Well, get to work now, <laughs> you know. And I just had to keep following. And I didn't spend a lot of time thinking, gee, this is a lot, a lot of work. Because if I did that, that was a distraction. I really just had to stay focused and follow. And it was a following in a, a feeling sense, a connectedness sense. It was also a hearing. I just kept listening and it was telling me what to, to come for, what was to come forward. Um, but that said, you know, I still had to sit down and actually type the thing and consider things and discuss things. And, and you've been part of that, you know, helping to clarify along the way. So thank you so much for that. And, and really from the very beginning, the whole inspiration and openness that you met me with allowed it to come out because I just found any barriers within myself I could get over or just disappeared. So, you know, blessings and thank you to you too. Well, you know, there is something that you, and you know, for me, it's really an honor for all of us here. It's an honor, but I was struck by a couple things after going back and rereading the book, but one, one in particular, which I know Jessica and I are, are very deeply affected by here recently you know, we had a, a series, an event that happened that we participated in and we came back and on the plane, we looked at each other and we said, we're different. We're different. And it took a little bit to figure that out. But right here, you say it. Here's what you say right out of the gate. You say, by following this timeless wisdom, we discover something universal, unchanging and all powerful within us. And I think that's what we were sensing as we looked at each other on this airplane. And, 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 and really, I, I'm not one to really uh, grapple for finding words. And, and I, I, I couldn't find the word. And she said it. She said, we're inspired in a different way. And this book does that. It's, what I love about what you've done is you've not only taken this ancient, this, this rather this timeless wisdom, but you've created a way, not just to talk about it, but to teach it and for people to understand it and embody it in every day of their life. I would like you to talk a little bit about that because people that will get the book and they will think about it, they may be pleasantly surprised to literally find that this is a guide as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, it, the, the wisdom is timeless. Uh, and I've specifically thought of the word timeless rather than ancient, because ancient timeless is, you know, in the past, it's timeless. It's of all time. It's beyond time. And it's interesting when you said you found it difficult, you're one who's not usually lost for words, you found it difficult to <laughs> express what you're experiencing because that connection to your deep inner self is beyond language so it literally boggles the mind the mind doesn't know you know pulls it stuff it knows to try and express something but this is beyond that so you have to let normal speech fall back and allow different speech to come forward um, that's coming from a deeper realm and that deeper realm is where this timeless wisdom abides. Um, it, and it's there all the time. It's a thread that's run through all time, past, present, and in future, so-called, those concepts. Um, and it's there for all humanity to 
connect back to themselves. And we need that, otherwise we get lost. But as you can feel, one connection completely changes everything. People talk about wanting to change their life. Just one connection seems like it's infinitesimal, but it's profound mm. and can shift the whole thing. Doesn't mean it's not work, and that's why you need the practices. Because it's like saying, I'm going to run a marathon today, <laughs> and you think, Great, come back to me after 42 point whatever kilometers. Tell me how you got on. That's not going to happen. I mean, you've got to actually practice because there's habits within our system and they need to be cleared out. That's all. You know, one of the things that I, I realized in going back and looking at this again, and, and here, let, let me ask you about this because this is what my latest discovery was. Um, I was really struck by how people look at Sanskrit in the, in the outer world, how the people that studied it. And, and what I thought about was how profoundly um, vague sometimes the conversation has been in the shows I've done with people. And when you wrote the book and you've talked about it, there's nothing vague about it, right? you were very clear about the power of each word, each phrase, and then the concepts that you developed, which we're gonna talk about today. You know, whether we're gonna talk about referencing FUSE program or we're looking at some other aspect of it. And that's what I'm really struck by. Clearly, the people in our pop culture, just so you know, they get it and they don't even know what they get. I mean. <laughs> They are tattooing this all over their bodies. And you and I have commented on a couple of them that are just not, they're just not the right thing. And yet they don't have your wisdom, but they know. Can you talk about the knowing part of this? Do, do you see what I mean? There's like a yeah. knowing. Yeah. Well, it goes back to your experience um, that you said that you, when you were with Jessica, um, it is a knowing and it's, beyond, behind, beneath, um, it's of another level of consciousness from the normal level that we operate. Nothing wrong with that. But, <clears throat> excuse me, the um, language, our thought processes, and therefore our actions um, are coming from a certain level. But to actually still become a little stiller and connect to something deeper um, that's ever present it's not like we have to go somewhere i don't have to leave this room and go and sit on a mountain to connect with this it is utterly practical it is here now always here now but it's of another level of consciousness and we need to be still and we need to be told about it and we need to in a sense learn how to co to connect we are always connected but we need to just actually be still and get beyond the normal stuff that gets in the way and that stuff that gets in the way is not it feels like it's deep but it's about as you know it's like wallpaper on a wall it's just the glue's quite strong yeah uh, you know and, yeah. and it's just releasing that that's why we need to work on those habits but that connection then is literally beyond our normal thought and language processes that's why we get this sense of expansion and all the usual thoughts and words fall away and it becomes more a sense of feeling, a being. Um, and then we can express from another level. Um, when I started writing the book and I wrote the introduction, there I am with this, like the very beginning of the book, I've got this blank screen, blank page. And I think, how do I start writing this book? What do I write? This is the founding sound of the book. This is like the dough of the octave. Um, and I thought of my teacher and he said, you always start from the absolute. And every meeting and lecture he gave, he always started from the absolute statement of truth about the universality of everything. And, so, and as soon as I remembered that, then it came. But that came from another level. I didn't think it. So that yeah. opening sentence is directly yeah. like that. Yeah, and that, that's what I love about this because, you know, we are now entering into a decade and some people have referenced this decade uh, from 
from scripture that goes back thousands of years is reference to the power and the embodiment of this particular energy here, the level of expansiveness. But here's the thing, Sarah, that I want to ask you about is that that those are great concepts, but how do we literally embody that energy without having the blueprint that you've put together here? in the way that you talk about conscious confidence, you know, the programs you develop with it, but also the balancing that you reference of the body, mind, and heart. And I think that is something we should talk about because as we move forward in this world of smartphones, no phones, watch phones, who knows what, um, we have completely stepped away from the idea of creating any kind of harmonic balance between the body, mind, and heart. Talk about the importance of that, if, if you would. Well, it's utterly essential because number one, it's actually natural. Um, we've just got so used to being disconnected and discombobulated most of the time between the body, mind, heart, and spirit. <laughs> what? <laughs> um, and, and most of the time our attention is down on our physical body naturally and, you know, in the mind. And then we're, when the feelings play up, we, we start thinking, gee, yeah, better, better check in with the emotions. What are they telling me? Um, and, you know, you get a lot of talk about emotions and all that, but there's this, this fundamental disconnect that as a being, as a human being, a uh, as a human being, we we are we have these uh, component parts. It sounds a bit mechanistic, but let's work with this model. Um, we have these parts, and if you consider them like bodies, then like of the physical body, they need nourishment. They need food. They need nourishment. They need exercise. They need movement, and they need rest. And if you understand it like that, and that is a, just a, a concept that we can all get, it's not hard, then suddenly you think, all right, well, what is the food for the mind? What is good nourishment for the mind? Because, you know, there's plenty, eat kale, drink celery juice, yeah. quinoa, uh, I don't know what, keto, this, that, the other, everything about the food, right? So the physical body, generally speaking, there's enough knowledge, right? In fact, some would say there's too much, right? Yeah. <laughs> just do just do what your mother said, and I think you'd be right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Not too much of anything. But then, so that's the, the food, exercise, and rest for the physical body. But the mind, just consider this for a body. Then the question is, what is good nourishment for the mind? Yeah. Do you consider that? And then, you know, we've got our phones. Well, is what is on that screen all the time? Is that good nourishment? Some of it may be. But I would assert that a lot of it isn't. Right. right. It'd be, it's like sitting there eating junk food the whole time. Well, we know physically you feel terrible. It's not, gonna, it's not good. Well, we're doing that to our mind, right? Yeah. And then we wonder why the mind's, um, you know, not in a good state and doesn't serve us well because the mind is a servant, right? Then we think, well, what's good exercise for the mind? Well, robust debate is good exercise for the mind. Have your thoughts challenged? So you have to think deeply. And if you've taken in good material for the mind, so beautiful language, music, art, um, being with nature, the good things that uplift and feed the mind and make it feel lighter and, and happier, as it were, um, and steadier, then you can exercise it just like the body you fed it well exercise it and yeah. you can engage in good debate if you only talk about the same things all the time and not get challenged to answer questions for example your your mind will get sloppy just like your muscles aren't challenged yeah. and then rest the mind needs rest and of course that's presence mindfulness awareness attention and of course meditation it covers everything and then you consider that for the spirit and for the heart. And then we're talking about actually integrating all these parts into what is in fact a natural state. Shouldn't be seen as special for weddings and bar mitzvahs. This is, uh, this is natural. You know? Yeah. Well, you know, and I want to talk about this when we come back. I want to also mention to everybody this book, 
boy, I'm telling you, we're going to tell you how to get a copy of it. We've got a few other really goodies to share. Uh, Sarah Main is the author of Conscious Confidence. When we come back, we're going to dig a little bit deeper into what you just said. One of my favorite uh, topics to avoid, conscious and unconscious confidence. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a short break. When we come back, are you even aware that there is such a thing as unconscious confidence? When we come back, we're going to talk about what the possibilities are and what the tools are that Sarah has created, not just in the book, but in her coaching platform. And what role does the fear shadow play in either opening the gateway? to possibilities or slamming the door shut. Let's take a short break. We'll be right back with Sarah Main and Conscious Confidence. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Oh, my goodness. I have waited for this day. I have so waited for this day to actually hold, right, knocking my mic. I'm so excited. I'm like knocking the microphone. But to hold the book up and to understand that Sarah Main beyond writing the book, has created a body of work. You know, just like this is timeless, what she has done in, I think, like five different parallel pathways in the past year is not just create something to read, but something for each of us to embody in our lives every day. And that's what's important. The other thing I love, Sarah, about what you've created as well is beyond this is an entire coaching platform, yeah. is a body of work that you're going to be busy doing. Um, which, because sometimes to do this on your own, at least for me, it's difficult. Um, how do we get a copy of the book and any other announcements you want to tell us about? I'm so happy. Congratulations to you, boy. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. Well, the book is available on Amazon.com, on um, at Barnes and Noble, uh, IndieBound, and on the Inner Traditions website. And if you're in Australia, on Booktopia.com.au. Um, so that's to get the book. Uh, and there's an ebook version as well. I think if you have a Kindle ebook or something like yeah. that. You can read it uh, as an ebook that's available. And I've also narrated the audio book, uh, which is coming. And uh, so that'll be good because the Sanskrit and the, the material does lend itself, apart from reading it, to hearing it, because that means it can go deeper and make, bring the sounds alive. So there's that. Um, and you can go to my website as well, consciousconfidence.com. That's consciousconfidence.com. And, and you can link through and purchase the book there. Um, so that's the book side of things. You can go to my website and see the sort of coaching work I do and the speaking work that I do. Uh, and also just learn more about conscious confidence. But the book does synthesize everything and clarify everything, uh, certainly. And that's, I think that's very helpful. Uh, and also, I'm on social media on Facebook and Instagram, so you can go there, Sarah Main Conscious Confidence, and uh, you know, ask me a question, make a statement, engage yeah. with me. I'd love to talk to you. A lady the other day left a wonderful uh, story and it shared her experience of developing confidence within herself, and it struck me, even though she didn't have any access to Sanskrit, I could see exactly the progression of the FUSE program in what she did. And it was really wonderful to hear from her. So that was very uh, exciting. So there's uh, social media and also I've got a very special thing coming. I've got some beautiful wristbands because whether you like it or not, Smarana, which is memory in Sanskrit, needs our memory needs strengthening. And we're, you know, we often wear wristbands and things. And so I've developed these beautiful wristbands. I don't know if I can get it up to the camera and you can see, is that reversed? Probably is. But there's actually, oh, yeah. there's actually Sanskrit on that wow. and, on the, and on the inside as well. Wow. It says, it says prema, pure love. Let pu uh, pure universal love flow to all. 
um, mm. and, and there's wristbands in for guys and girls, gold and silver, leather mm. and steel, all beautifully gift boxed, and yeah. they're come and they're coming too as well, and they help support the memory. They make a beautiful gift, but they do help support the memory uh, and keep you connected. And, and I think we need that until our muscles strengthen. And that I actually address, I think it's chapter seven of the book, the seven steps. Um, we need that support. We need company, good company of uh, like-minded people. We, and that's where the uh, social media groups are very good. So if you follow me on Facebook and in, on Instagram, there's regular things to support your memory and make you feel that you're not, and, and remind you that you're not alone. Yeah. Um, and and then things like the wristbands just help in terms yeah. of supporting and staying connected. Yeah. There's no question about it. I mean, you know, one of the things that I've learned about that for myself, and we're going to talk about that because it really does have to do with conscious and unconscious uh, confidence and the fear of shadow. And, you know, sometimes when you don't have something that has been infused with this timeless wisdom we're talking about with the love that you've put into it, but just having that is a reminder of what it is we can get back to, right? Yes. Yes. And, and it, it's so powerful and works so well. Sometimes, Sarah, don't you think that that sometimes is all we need is a reminder it, it, it is ultimately the wisdom traditions um, indicate, say, that all we need is a reminder. It's like waking up from a sleep because we are pure, perfect and complete now. We, we always have been. Uh, we, the, the timeless wisdom is pure, perfect and complete. Sanskrit, the word Sanskrita means pure, <coughs> excuse me, the word Sanskrita means pure and perfectly formed. So the wisdom, the energy is pure and perfectly formed and mm. it hasn't been changed or corrupted and, or diluted. So therefore, one word in Sanskrit has this incredible potency because it's pure and perfectly formed and you're connecting with that and that connects you to that perfection within yourself, that wholeness within yourself. That's why you feel satisfied and at peace and sort of, ah, oh, that sense with just a little connection. And that is available all the time, but we do need help with the memory and we need to be told because, frankly, if we're not told, we don't know. Why would we know? We need new knowledge. Uh, and the seven steps actually in the book covers off on that. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I want to talk about this sort of to set the stage for, you know, uh, uh, what you talk about in the seven gateways. And, and the reason I want to start here is because there's it's very clear all the studies that are coming out right now about uh, generations of kids, adults alike. The studies are just very clear, at least for folks here in the United States, the highest level of anxiety of any culture, right? The latest study shows. Yeah. But, you know, you know, you ask several questions. I want to open it up with this, you know, to take us on this journey, right? To look at the fear shadow. You say, what happens when the circumstances change? Are we full of doubt? Do we feel threatened? Can we respond and take action? Do we become upset and agitated? Have we allowed our confidence to be dependent on familiar situations and actions? Can we adapt and thrive in changing situations? Can we take our confidence with us from the familiar to the new and the challenging? Mm -hmm. Now, any other person that would ask those questions, uh, it would be a little bit overwhelming, but the rest of the book addresses that. And I think that's what's so brilliant about this but part of that is this unconscious confidence can you talk i i know you and i have talked about it but i don't know why it's hitting me like that today <laughs> the fact that we can operate at an unconscious level in this way and not yeah. understand the implications it's really daunting to think about that yeah it, well it, it, it is daunting initially but it, it that's when we just actually wake up to something new and we suddenly go oh uh, because 
what I saw when I started initially, and this was way back when you and I were first talking about this, I suddenly realised um, because the roots of this began with investigating um, musicians that were experiencing stage fright and having to take medication to overcome stage fright. And that's the, the seed of where I then got into the confidence and that opened everything up. But um, mostly our confidence, unconsciously, uh, we're unaware. And to say unconscious is not, um, I'm not being judgmental. It's just simply yeah. giving a name to something. Yeah. We're unaware is it, it's it, it often is either just a personality trait of someone who appears confident and that can come out as brash or sort of rather egotistical and, and in some cases unpleasant. But if you, when I asked people, they said if they think of confident people, their mind immediately projects onto someone who's rather brash and out there, right? Um, and, and certainly there's a personality type like that, but a lot of us don't have that sort of type. Right. personality type right <laughs> so then we label ourselves unconfident right in contrast to someone like that and that's not true so that's number one then there's another form of unconscious confidence and there's no problem with this either is confidence is born of familiarity and that's just purely repetition you get good at something and good that you get good at something it's like when you first learn to drive it's a very cognitive thing you can't have the radio on when you're driving because you've got to concentrate on driving don't turn the radio on <laughs> you couldn't possibly talk to someone next to you you're driving and then as you get more experience and you get more familiar you can have the radio on um and it becomes a bit more associative, as we would say in sort of right. normal parlance. Um, and then you can chat to someone and have the radio on. And you're, and a lot of that is running on auto. But even then, when you want to change lanes in tricky traffic, you're, you know, you may need to turn the radio down because you actually need to concentrate. So this sort of confidence is born of just familiarity, just skills. You get good at something, you know. I'm, I'm cooking for a dinner party for 20 people and, you know, there are some recipes that I've cooked quite a few times and I've got a familiarity with them yeah. and I can play around with them. Great. Different from a new recipe where I'm following everything. So children need that sort of thing. We need routines. We need that familiarity. But understand that if we invest all our confidence and our self-assurance at that level that I have to have um, had experience of this beforehand I have to be prepared if that's the only way you can really feel comfortable then that is at a level where we're trying to get all the experiences of life and get them into that box of familiarity by having repeated them a few times wow. and conscious confidence is that connection with yourself where you can just show up with life as it's happening and have a steadiness to respond and enjoy and meet the challenges um, and let it be a bit messy. You know, yeah. it doesn't all have to be perfect, but know that it's all okay. <clears throat> and when the opportunities come, you can say yes to them. And this is normal and natural. And this is what the wisdom traditions knew about, they know about, and they're just offering us a way to live like that. Because yeah. to have to have everything all prepared or familiar is not helping it's trying to bring us down to that level of familiar familiarity which is a level but there are much higher greater levels as well yeah you know one of the things i was struck by you know as it relates to that and for those of you just tuning in you know thrilled to be having this conversation with sarah Mann. she is the author of this amazing new book everybody conscious confidence but she's also the host of that show and i want to make sure people know that in addition to the book, they could go to your website and they can listen to many conversations that you've had about this. I gotta ask you this question because this was like, I had an aha moment today. As I was going back through the book, I, I noticed the position of positive attitude in the book. And very specifically, now I know we have talked about this, but I never saw this, I hadn't seen this before. 
in the book, it's positioned between core values and it and the, the seven gateways. Yeah. And I thought, wow, I'm sure Sarah did that on purpose, but there is a relationship between our core values. Is is, is having a positive is it a bridge of sorts? Yeah. Our attitude, and I, look, I was surprised by this. You know, you, you talk about a positive attitude, talk about attitude, everyone talks about it. But when I went into it and I started asking people about, okay, attitude, when, you know, doing a bit of a Rorschach on them. When I say the word attitude, what do you immediately think? 99.9% .9 of the people I asked, and I just asked all sorts of people, people I knew, people I didn't know, they said the first thing that comes up is negative insofar as they just think of attitude is, is mostly negative. What they experience is attitude, if they think about it, is negative. A number of the people that had teenage kids, they only thought about attitude in relation to teenagers having a negative, bad attitude. Yeah. That they laughed and, and said, I say to my kids, you've got a bad attitude, you've got to change your attitude, right? <laughs> Right. <laughs> okay. Without, and then so, as some of them who are even a little bit more self-aware said, when I think about attitude about myself, it's an area I, I find myself backpedaling very quickly. I don't want to go there. Right. So it was so interesting. When I looked at the Sanskrit, it just struck me so powerfully. And I had aha moments about attitude um, because, you know, I'd been a teacher for 30 years and we, you talk about attitude with kids. Um, it's, it's like a lens through which we see the world. And if you imagine like a spotlight and you put a pink uh, gel in front of it, all the light will be pink or a blue gel, all the light will be blue. If you have a glass of water and you put a drop of blue ink in the water, that drop is not going to sit in one corner. The whole glass yeah. of water will be pervaded by that one drop of ink. So if you think of that in terms of attitude, getting a handle on what attitude is and what our attitude is, it's colouring everything we see every moment of the day. And I was just thinking about this the other day and, and it, I thought, wow, you know, it just sort of struck me. I had aha moments about attitude just the other day as well. Yeah. Um, and because the Sanskrit, it, what was so clear when I looked up attitude and really went down into the etymology of it, um, stiti is your stance or your point of view through which you, you know, the place from which you see the world. Bhava is your motivation. That's more emotional. It's your motivation or your intent. And vritti is your conduct. So you have your stance or point of view, your motivation or intention and your conduct all bound up. It's all contained in attitude. It's not just a mental concept. And that was something people said to me. They said, when I think of attitude, I think mental concept. It's not connected to your heart. And Sanskrit is showing, uh, 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 it's absolutely it is. all there. Yeah. So to make, a, a, and what also struck me was about, and this is the thing I find so exciting about attitude is, um, and I just, when I was doing the show on positive attitude, I've done a, I've done a series of six shows uh -huh. on each of the six steps of the Fuse program. Thanks to Jessica who said that to me. Yeah. <laughs> you could do a show on each of those, so I did. Um, and when I was really drilling down into that, it struck me the thing about um, attitude is we have 100%, and the wisdom traditions indicate this, 100% control over our attitude. Can't control circumstances, but this we can. Yeah. And it takes a clear decision or resolution for a positive attitude. And that decision may need strengthening, certainly. That's why we need good company. We need reminders like the, the bands. Yep. We need to keep reading things and hearing things. We need to support our decision and a, for it to keep a positive attitude. And once you do that, I, I, it just changes everything. Yeah. I mean, it yeah. really does. Yeah. It does. And I was I was struck by it for a lot of reasons. Um, one, I really do believe that there is letting go of a decade, you know, and moving into a new one. Yeah. And the reason we can, you know, we can't choose the, the 
end of one and the beginning of another, but we can really choose how we move forward in it. And I, I think part of this for me is, and I want to talk with you about this. I know that you're going to be doing a lot of interviews and talking with folks about uh, the gateways and other things. But there is this beautiful pathway that you lay out here. When I think about this, and I've heard, and you and I have talked about it, but I'm not really quite, I, I didn't quite feel it, right? I understood it, but feel it, because it's really different when you feel it until this last go around and talking with you, because it's almost as if it all is coming, to, it all comes together. What do you think out of, out of, out of the, the seven gateways, what are we challenged most by as a society now? I know that's an interesting question, is it? <laughs> Sarah's like, everything. <laughs> oh, no. <clears throat> well, the seven gateways, it's um, based, uh, you know, it comes from the Yoga Vasishta. <clears throat> And it's understanding the journey of transformation. Um, and I don't, I, I put it in very specifically so people understand that when they want to make a change, they want transformation. They need to understand the process, that there is a journey. And everyone talks about, oh, it takes a journey. Well, the wisdom traditions actually know about this and have laid it out. And it just takes all the, the mystery out of it in a sense. I mean, it's, there is mystery, but it, it makes it clear. And I was taught this decades ago, and I, I realised I need to put this in the book, um, just a, an outline of the fact that there are seven steps to transformation. Mm -hmm. the, the final four steps are really, and I keep saying this in the book, you don't need to worry about those. These are of another level of consciousness. But the first three steps are where we need to put our attention because the rest will genuinely take care of themselves. When you have that aha moment, that inspiration should pair each other, a good impulse, you know, and that's reading something, hearing something, and you could get it from this book, you know. You read it, just one of the stories, these beautiful stories, will just, ah, oh. and immediately that is a natural connection and immediately a desire arises, you want to know more. Um, and that is natural. You want to follow this, something arises. And that, and you need new knowledge. You need to actually get new knowledge outside the normal parameters of what we think. Yeah. And you may think that's coming from the internet and from social media, but I can tell you it isn't <laughs> because apart from anything else, all the data mining that's going on, they're making sure that you are only being served those things that they have, the algorithms have determined right. is what you want. So you're actually making sure, they're making sure that you have got your blinkers on. Yeah. Right. And the thing is about transformation, we need to get, think outside the square, outside the box, however you want to describe it. We've got to clear all of that out. Right. So you need to be reading something new, hearing something new, and then putting it into practice. It's like having recipe books and not having actually cooked those recipes and then eaten the food. Yeah. Yeah. It's the experience of it. And then the transformation comes, right? So first step, second step is that reading and hearing and learning new knowledge, but genuinely new knowledge, things, oh, I didn't realise, didn't think of that before. Those sorts of expressions are indications, those aha moments are taking us outside our normal processes and thought patterns, which are like blinkers, and that creates the same experience, right? And then the third step is what's called tanamanasa. So we have shubhechcha, good impulse. The next one is suvicharana, right, which is um, uh, what's, how did I describe it? Uh, you were sort of acquiring new knowledge and seeking new knowledge and, and gaining new knowledge and also putting it into practice. Yeah. And then Tanumanasa is the thinning, the attenuation of the mind where the mind starts getting clearer because unnecessary things are falling away. And that's covered in the FUSE program. Yeah. 
unnecessary things are falling away and the mind gets in better shape. The mind and the heart get in better shape, just like the physical body if we started to train. Um, and those first three steps are clearing out a whole lot of stuff. And that is what we call the journey, right? And then we reach a platform of what's called Satwa Pati, which is um, a, a certain level of assimilation and illumination in that we have a level of strength and conscious confidence. There's further to go, but that is of another higher level altogether. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. You know, the, the seven steps are profound and very practical. And the way that you've written about them and the stories that you tell about them, the stories are wonderful, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, some of them I've heard, but most of them I've not. And I really struck by, you know, here's the thing, and I know we only have a few minutes left. Um, here's what I'm struck by. Social media, let's just reference it as social media. Social media is entirely based on probabilities. Yeah. Probabilities, probability theory, probability based on sets of information they gather. Transformation is based on possibilities and they're not the same. No. And when you lay out the way that you have in the book, when you present this to us in that way, but you give us a structure to engage in the world of possibilities. See, that's the key for me in, in what you teach in the book. It's, you know, some, sometimes some of us, you know, like we're kids and you go out to the diner and then there's these dots that you have to connect on the paper and you have to go from this dot to this dot to this. And some people, right, get that, oh my gosh, I'm creating an elephant. And then others of us have to actually connect the dots, stare at it for a while and say, oh yeah, that's an elephant. <laughs> But this is what you've done. You've laid it out in a way that it doesn't matter where you are in the journey of transformation. You, you have created a conversation and a teaching for us that allows us to take steps towards greater possibilities. And I think that's the beauty of, of, of what you've created. And I know there's so much more to come. <laughs> <laughs> it, also, that's a great way of putting it about possibility and probabilities that's really excellent I'm, I'm kind of write that down uh, well, well, yeah, <laughs> but, then, but you think of you yeah. think of that in terms of young people wouldn't you want to give that to young people that you know that, that these possibilities that are beyond the online experience and the digital and the virtual experience and the social media experience that they're are all these possibilities and it's true they are actually there they're within yourself that's who you are the wisdom traditions heaven i mean it's amazing the wisdom traditions knew this before the internet yeah. it's amazing yeah. who knew yeah uh, and and they wrote about it and they spoke about it there used to be an uh, originally an oral oral tradition spoke heard spoken heard passed on all through hearing and speaking and mm -hmm. then that start writing it down um and this you know hearing it goes into your heart and that's why the audio book's quite handy because you can hear something you'll hear something in the book that you didn't pick up when you were reading it and I it, can't will go, wait. it will go even deeper the hearing is so profoundly powerful when, um, when will we get the audio book I haven't, uh, it's coming. Okay, okay, all right. It's done. I, it's complete. I, the sale date isn't released at the moment, but. But that's coming. okay. It's more to be, it's more to look forward to. Yeah, um, but, but that's, you know, what you talk about is exactly right. And the thing is with the book, you can read all the stories. If you don't want to read chapter by chapter, you could just read all the stories. You could just read all the practices. You could just read all the contemporary accounts of people. Um, you could just read all the bits about Sanskrit. So you could read it thematically or uh, just chapter by chapter. Um, Sarah, first of all, thank you so much. I know we're going to be talking again and I want to thank you. And boy, it is so wonderful to be sharing this. For those of you out there, please go over to Amazon, get a copy of Sarah's book, Conscious Confidence. Uh, you can either get it as well on Kindle. So 
you know, one of the things I love to do. Also, on your website, they'll be able to get the bracelets as well. Is that correct? If they're coming. They're coming. Uh, they're coming soon. <laughs> okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to keep t- telling folks about them when they, we'll, we'll have to have like a birthing ceremony on it. Yeah, yeah. They, they'll be available on Amazon. I'll Thank you. you. <laughs> um, ConsciousConfidence.com is the website. Sarah, I, one last question. I mean, there's a lot to talk about, but I do want to ask you this last question. And I know sometimes you do uh, end the show in a very special way. What is your message for the last part of the book? The part that's about living beyond limits. Uh, <clears> that <throat> so that is how we are intended. We're not intended to live within limits. We are limitless universal beings. That's what the wisdom traditions are telling us. Um, I heard this from a young age. I just You know, it doesn't mean I don't meet limits, but they can be transcended. And that is the the most powerful, uh, life-changing way to live. And everyone can do it with the right knowledge and practice. Everyone can do that because that is how we are designed. And I would encourage everyone to hear that and start pursuing that because that genuinely will change your life. Sarah, thank you so much. What's your personal message? What do you want to leave us with today? Um, Some beautiful Sanskrit. Would you like that? Yes, I would. (laughs) Um, I'll give you the beautiful peace prayer, which is a personal favorite of mine and of many people. And from the Yajur Veda, so it's many, many thousands of years old. And it goes, uh, peace in the heavens, peace in the space between, peace on earth. Peace in the plants, peace in the trees, peace in all powers, peace, only peace. May peace and peace and peace be everywhere. Om Dhyā Shanti, Antarikshan Shanti, Prithivi Shanti, Apa Shanti. O Shadhaya Shanti, Vanaspataya Shanti, Vishwe Deva Shanti, Brahma Shanti, Sarvang Shanti, Shanti Reva Shanti, Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. shanti. Mm. Beautiful. Sarah Main, everyone. I'm Dr. Pat. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you. I want to thank all of you for tuning us in, turning us on. Thank you, Jessica, for pushing all the right buttons as you normally do. And for all of you out there, there's so much in this book that will help you open up the, the one gateway that maybe you're waiting for, for a fabulous 2020 and beyond. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next time. 